by the way, I'm going to read. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> oh, it says we're streaming. It says we're live on Facebook. Yay. I think that means we're live. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Miller-Rogan. Um, if you joined us last week um, and are joining us again, thank you for bearing with us with our technical difficulties. Um, I am, uh, as you may know, a co-founder of Hilarity for Charity. Um, and throughout this month, we're honoring uh, national, uh, which is Alzheimer's National Awareness Month and National Family Caregivers Month. Uh, we're doing that through our Many Faces of Alzheimer's campaign. And we are sharing special stories and powerful ways that you can make a difference. So today kicks off our very first uh, Facebook Live chat. So thank you for being here with us um, and for bearing with me as I speak to all of you. Um, and a special thanks to Home and Stead Senior Care for their endless support to us and to help uh, make these chats run very smooth all month long, smoother than last week. <laughs> um, okay, today, super exciting. Um, I'm joined by Aijin Pu, who is the Executive Director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the co-director of Caring Across Generations. She was named one of Time's 100 most influential people. And on top of all that is a MacArthur Genius Award winner. It's crazy. Um, okay, so I have a few questions for her, but feel free to post in comments and questions. And then after I ask a few questions, um, we will get to your questions before we wrap up. Okay, I hope this is going well. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Hi. Um, okay, so you're on a mission to redefine caregiving. I guess start at the beginning. What set you out on this path? How did you start doing this tremendous work that you do? Well, first, it's great to be with you and talk to you. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. This is really fun for me. I love talking with Lauren and also engaging with the caregiver community. And happy Family Caregivers Month to all of the family caregivers out there. Um, <laughs> And so what set me on this path? I would say it started out just as a kid growing up in an intergenerational home. I was really raised by my grandparents and just loved having them in my life. And um, when they got older, they actually needed assistance. And it was at a point where, there was a point where my grandfather actually um, couldn't see any longer and needed much more assistance than my family could offer. So we had to put him in a nursing home against his wishes. And it was really painful to have to do, but then I actually visited him there and it was really hard to see him in that context. Um, yeah. He was sharing a room with six other people who didn't speak Chinese. It was like unfamiliar food. His schedule was not in his control. Uh, the lights didn't work. There were so many things about it that just felt like, uh, his quality, he deserved so much better, especially after caring for so many of us. And it just got me on a path of thinking about what kind of care of people we love deserve in this world and how do we prepare for it so that nobody has to age and live out their um, older years in that kind of circumstance. And so I started out trying to figure out how to improve our care systems and, and also at the same time started working with caregivers, professional caregivers who really love what they do. Like many of them were just born to care for others and, um, and do that work with a ton of pride, but it's as a profession, it's really hard to sustain in because the wages are low. There's not a lot of respect or benefits or economic security. And so we sometimes end up losing our best caregivers to fast food and retail and other jobs. And so that whole picture just kind of led me to believe that we could be doing much, much better. And we have to, because there's such a large and growing older population that's going to need that support to live well. Yeah, totally. What if, if we did that, if we were, you know, supporting caregivers, supporting our loved ones as they aged in, in an, an ideal world. Um, what, what would that kind of look like? Well, how do we value caregivers and caregiving? What are, you know, what are some of the things that, that would mean for all of us? Well, one piece of it is I think that all of us are do doing, providing care in different ways, whether we're family caregivers or professional caregivers, even friends and neighbors. Yeah. And we very rarely support 
each other to play those roles. And yeah. family caregivers are often really isolated and under a ton of pressure because they're caring for their loved ones and having to work and kids yeah. at the time. So I think a world where we're supporting care fully would mean we're really supporting caregivers and investing in them, whether they're family caregivers or professional caregivers. So making the profession a good job, making family caregiving something that's really valued in our society, and then to make care much more affordable. Because I know a lot of us are really struggling to pay for the care that we need. And there aren't a lot of options out there for getting that support. So I think a lot of policy solutions and other solutions can help to make care much more affordable and accessible. And that's a lot of what Caring Across Generations is working on right now. Yeah, that's amazing. Could you tell, will you tell me a little bit more? What are you guys doing? Tell me about you know, some things that you've had success on. What, what are some of the bigger struggles that you guys are working on? Give us, give us an update about where you guys are these days. I know you just had the main initiative that, you know, yeah. but tell me everything. Tell us yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. So Caring Across Generations formed uh, seven years ago as a big campaign to bring together family caregivers, people like my grandparents and my parents who are needing care and um, professional caregivers to really reimagine the policies and the programs that could support us all. Yeah. And so we've been building kind of from the ground up. So we started out having these care congresses around the country where we brought everybody together to talk about what the challenges are and what the solutions could be. And that led us to creating policy frameworks for states. So we know that it's going to take some time for us to pass any kind of federal legislation like the Affordable Care Act, which was kind of a big national initiative. How do we start from the states building yeah. the kind of care infrastructure we need? So we now have initiatives in 13 different states around the country where there are these great coalitions coming together of voters and everyday families saying to their elected leaders, we need real solutions to help us care for each other. We had a big victory in Hawaii a couple years ago. Yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, it's the first ever family caregiver benefit called the Kapuna Caregiver Program, where basically if you're caring for a loved one at home, you can apply for a benefit of up to $75 per day to help you pay for, it's kind of huge, right? So I mean, it's not everything we need but it sure goes a long way when you're just trying to pay the bills and so it helps you cover costs of like home modifications or also home care services so you don't have to miss work to take a loved one to a doctor's appointment things like that so that program is in motion in Hawaii and we keep expanding it and it's really really making a difference in people's lives yeah. in Maine we worked on a ballot initiative to make home care universally accessible to everyone in Maine who needs it which was a big bold program we didn't get it an amazing initiative yeah. It was an amazing initiative. And we talked to hundreds of thousands of voters throughout the course of the year about it. And everybody agrees we need a solution. People didn't agree on the solution, but now we have the opportunity in the legislative session to actually design legislation with the input of all the different stakeholders and keep moving that solution forward. And we're doing similar initiatives in a whole bunch of states around the country. What are some of the things that are on these initiatives? Like what type of legislation? Is it similar to what is in Hawaii? Is it different for each state? What's the sort of broad dream? Yeah, it's a little different for each state because each state is a little different in terms of what they have in place already and what, um, what, how the policies and programs are structured. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to complement and supplement Medicaid um, so that people who are earning too much to be eligible for Medicaid, um, but too little to afford something as expensive as long-term care insurance. So many people are in that boat. It's sorry to interrupt. When we read our applications for Hilarity for Charity, that is one of the, the areas where so many people are stuck. Yeah, sorry, continue. No, yeah, and the other thing is we, we shouldn't have to spend down and impoverish ourselves to get access to home care, which is what a lot of people do because Medicaid's their only option. Yep. So I, that's what we're trying to do is basically create more choices. And so yes. Hawaii was one version. Another version is in Washington state. There's something called the Long-Term Care Trust Act, 
which has a ton of bipartisan support in the state. It's a new social insurance program that would make long-term care affordable, much more affordable for people in Washington. And the great thing is, is like Washington is almost like this model because once they have that in place and home care is more affordable for the consumers, mm -hmm. there's already a great, uh, like a really well prepared and trained home care workforce in the state because they have a great training program um, and ongoing education for the workforce. And it's a really sustainable job for the workers who do that work in Washington. So it's almost like you can start to see elements of what we need in the future in places like Hawaii and Washington. And once we get that momentum in states, I think we can see it happen nationally. That's amazing. That it, I'm, you know, from when I got involved in all of this uh, eight, seven, eight years ago, I just, I, I, I don't know, just because I'm inside of it, I feel like there is, is hope in, in so many areas, including caregiving and, and the work that you guys are doing is, is so much, uh, you know, is leading the charge in that. And that's amazing. So I'll just say thank you before I ask, how can we get involved? We had a question from someone named Rachel it says, how can we make increases in wages a reality for caregivers? So what, what can we be doing to help every caregiver and everyone who needs care improve the situation? Mm. It's a great question. I mean, I think one, just joining the movement, this is the kind of thing, there's so few issues in our country, especially now the political environment is so divisive. This is an issue that everyone experiences, regardless of where you live in a rural community or an urban community, race, class, everybody has loved ones that we worry about how we're gonna care for them. And so this can be a really unifying issue. And we are, we are in a moment, we're almost at a tipping point where people are starting to see that we need solutions. Yeah. And so I think if all of us join together, we can actually make more of those solutions more real. Um, so join, you can join Hilarity for Charity, Caring Across Generations. We're all working together, which is part of the beauty of it. It's like a real movement, a village coming into being around this issue. Um, and in terms of raising wages, there's a few different ways of going about it in the short term. And then I think in the long term, we're going to need bolder solutions. In the short term, we can raise reimbursement rates um, from Medicaid. I know it's a little wonky, but um, basically uh, the, some of these social programs reimburse states for, um, for home care. And um, the, the amount of money um, that states get sometimes determines how much can go towards wages. So if we raise those rates, we can also potentially raise wages. We can also try to, at the, at the state level, increase the percentage that goes to wages. Sometimes um, uh, home care agencies are reimbursed at $22 an hour, per, it depends on the state, but around 20 some dollars per hour. And oftentimes the home care worker only receives about $9 um, or $10 of that rate. And so you can increase the percentage a little bit and it goes a long way to making these jobs a little bit more sustainable for the workforce. But see, all of these things are kind of incremental changes. And because the wages are so low, I think we have to think a little bit bigger and longer term. And I think we have to join with agencies to say, we need to really invest in this entire industry in a different way. So many of us need care. This is not a problem that can be solved through tweaks. We have to actually think really big. And so that's why some of these measures like the Long-Term Care Trust Act, what it would do is create a lot more resources to be able to put into the entire care infrastructure to be able to improve training, raise wages, even provide access to benefits so that these jobs can be much more sustainable. So we've got to work in the short term, but also yeah. really long term. Yeah, I mean, they have to work together. I think that sort of leads into a good question that we just got. Um, how can those of us who are volunteer advocates, which so many people are, and ambassadors who work, uh, who work with their local uh, members of Congress, both at state and federal levels, how can they help uh, you make this a countrywide initiative? What could someone do today? What could they do, you know, if they have five minutes, if they have an hour, if they have a day, what are some specific things they should do? It's a great question. I love 
love it so much. This all of you are so engaged and moving forward. I think that if your elected officials start to hear from you, that you want them to be a care champion, that's actually huge because part of the challenge we face is that this issue hasn't been legible enough to our elected leaders as a priority among voters. We're trying to change that, but we need everyone to go to their elected officials and any candidate for office that wants to represent you to be able to say to them, representing us means actually championing real solutions around caregiving. We can ask them to introduce resolutions. We can ask them to introduce study bills that measure the need and the potential solutions at the state level. We can ask them, even members of Congress can hold hearings where family caregivers and people who need care can actually help to educate the legislature so that we're creating the context for real solutions to move forward. There's a lot we can do short of legislation like today to, to lay the groundwork. Yeah, and, I, and I'll say that, you know, as a storyteller, I think that so much of that just begins with, yes, telling your story to your, your representative, but also to your friend and your neighbor and to the people you work with. And that so much of the stigma that surrounds Alzheimer's and dementia and caring for those with that disease stems from the fact that so many people don't understand it. They don't understand the need that the how intense it is to uh, care for someone with dementia and so start with telling your story which of course is part of our campaign for this month um, and we want everyone to share their story but write it down send it to your representative tell them i care for my mother my father my grandfather my my friend whoever it is and say i need you to pay attention i need, need you to be a care champion and and you know we will reiterate this this conversation will be posted on our page and we'll reiterate these points that you can include and make that your first step in making change uh, in caregiving. Um, That's so that. true. I think culture change is such a big part of this. Right now we have this culture that's based on fear of aging. Uh. Right? and fear of just all the hard conversations that come along with when our loved ones change in terms of becoming more fragile or developing chronic illnesses, we actually have to talk about these things yeah. in order to actually be able to support each other. And that means a pretty big change in our culture. And that absolutely starts at home, right? Yeah, at home. yeah for sure. Um, all right, I feel like, are we supposed to I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Do we have any more questions? Anyone want to send anything else in? I'll give it a second. Oh, we got another one. Ah, yes. Okay. So um, this is from Olivia. As she says, speaking of getting everyone on board for talking with legislators, how can I and others with Hilarity and other Hilarity for Charity supporters get younger people involved and educated and use their voice for concerns such as this? So, you know, I think, you know, and I'll let you answer this, but I think that young people have such a power, especially in a disease like Alzheimer's and dementia, because people don't assume that it affects young people. And so when young people use their voices, in my experience, people tend to listen. And so, you know, young people have the, the energy and the, the, the uh, you know, the voice to, to shout and scream and tell their story. So, I'll answer that first for me. We'll see what, what do you think? I think it's huge because until this issue becomes an intergenerational issue, we're just not going to elevate it enough to the place where we need, where we can actually realize the solutions we need. As soon as this becomes visible and legible as an issue that affects all of us across generations, that's when we know we're going to be able to take it on in a different way. So the voices of young people, young voters, young people are such culture drivers. If we want to change culture, you guys, young people can do that. <laughs> you are, are gonna be the driving force of new cultural norms. And that's just gonna be a huge part of what we have to do. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I feel very energized about how young people are using their voices these days and, and hope that we can continue with this momentum. And I feel like people are really starting to like get it out there. And you know, everyone's feeling a lot of anxiety about many different things these days and like, but I think that young people are taking action. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, 
All right, I think I'm gonna wrap up because I think we're supposed to wrap up around now. Um, I don't know, is there anything else, any other messages that you think, you know, we can, you know, directions to give people to help in this fight? Any closing remarks? Yeah, so just um, you can find out more about Caring Across Generations at caringacross.org. Um, we're going to be doing a really fun campaign around a movie that's coming out called On the Basis of Sex. It's coming out in December, and it's about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's first big gender equality case, which was about a male family caregiver actually getting access to the tax benefits that he deserved as a caregiver, but because he was a man, he wasn't able to access them. So it's a huge opportunity for us to talk about caregiving and all the people who do it and all the support that, that they need going forward. So hopefully you can get involved in that campaign and see the movie and, um, and help us drive a cultural conversation around it. Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm Ever since I met you a few years ago, I'm constantly inspired by you and your amazing work and your spirit and you're so giving always. So thank you for giving your time and yourself to everyone because this is something that affects everyone. And if it doesn't affect you today, it will affect you in the future at some point. So this is really important stuff and, and you're an incredible human and I'm endlessly inspired. So thank you. Um, and to everyone out there, I hope you enjoyed uh, learning more about iGen's work um, and some ways that you can take action today in honor of National Alzheimer's Awareness Month and National Family Caregivers Month. Um, we're gonna be back on Friday at 12.30 Eastern and 9.30 Pacific as I re-sit down with Tony Hawk um, from last week. Um, you guys know him, he's a legend in his own right. Um, and um, he is using his voice to shed more light on Alzheimer's and what it is like to be a caregiver. Um, so you can connect with us on social media. You can share your own Alzheimer's story using the hashtag many phases of Alzheimer's. Um, be sure to join our mailing list. If you wanna give us some money, we'd love to take it. Um, we provide care to people who can't afford it in these times where we don't have enough legislation for caregivers. Um, if you don't know, we've provided over 230,000 hours of care uh, to people who can't afford it through our partnership with Home Instead. Um, but there are 16 million Americans that currently provide dementia related care. So, the, the need is endless. I read the applications that come into our program every single month, and I can tell you that we are so far from being able to award care to everyone who deserves it. So if you have any extra money lying around, you feel like helping people out, want to throw it away, we will promise to put it to good use. Um, all right, I guess that is it. Um, have a wonderful day, and we will see you all on Friday. Thank you. Yay, hilarity for charity. Bye. <laughs>